Careful with my hot tea there. Have you ever found yourself needing one of these? How about one of those? One of these? The chances are that you probably don't need or have any of these things. I just filmed a YouTube short, you may have seen it, that starred this yellow hacksaw and it got me feeling nostalgic. Why? Because like this hacksaw and all these other items, I had the pleasure of making them with my own two hands running dry here. Ah, I, just, I just got tea on the go. Nothing harder than that at the moment. Keep you hydrated. I've mentioned in previous videos that I started my venture into the workforce machining. Machinist apprenticeship and on to get the trade certification. And now if you asked me, I would, I don't even think, I'd have to start at the bottom again. I'd be an apprentice all over again. But it, it just, it made me feel so good to dig this hacksaw out and, and think about the experience that I had, you know, the, the college course. And for those of you that don't know how it works, oh, we're in high demand, phone dinging. There's four years to an apprenticeship uh, here where I live. So year one, two, three, and four, and for each of those sections, you, you actually go to school, a, a trade school or a college, and you progress. So I thought it would be fun to dig through, I rounded up the projects that were part of those college course uh, apprenticeship. The, the, the projects that were part of the apprenticeship that I, I made while I was in school. Let's jump in. Can we just appreciate this? Totally functional, lives right here in the drawer, and I still use the thing. So this, well, what did this involve? I'm trying to think here. We built the whole thing except for the plastic handle, and I do distinctly remember, because you gotta pay your own way, I think you had to bring in $5 extra. It wasn't even part of the tuition. You had to pay $5 to get the, the, the screw-on plastic handle, but the rest of it, taught us the operations of the oxyacetylene torch because we started with this piece of flat bar here, bent it into the arch shape. Now the challenge was there was no um, set path on how this was to be made. Just a group of I think 16 young enterprising men to work together to come up with a system to consistently build these hacksaws on which you would be graded because of course they gave you a drawing. It had to fit within certain parameters. So what we ended up doing actually, we made a jig on a fabrication bench with some simple pins that allowed us to bend the frame consistently. So we all ended up with something that fit the spec of the, the drawing. The block here on the end that was milled out of a solid piece. So it was a solid piece of square stock. It got turned down in the lathe. We threaded it on the end. We just did a YouTube short on a tap and die set. Well, the die would have been the tool used to cut the uh, external threads on, uh, on this portion of the hacksaw. Um, and of course, welding, because this eyelet at the end, on each end, uh, wasn't part of the deal. The uh, shank for the handle that was made, welded on, ground smooth. Um, but anyways, yeah, that is how that was made. And it's indexable. You can swap this blade from its current orientation and you can also turn it 90 degrees. There's a, there's a slot there for that as well. And, uh, and funny enough, the ball peen hammer was also recently featured in a YouTube short and it, it just is all rushing back to me. These pins that hold the blade in, they're actual steel pins that the ends are, are peened over. So there you go. Um, you know, these skills do come in handy. Uh, this you guys will recognize is, is just a simple drift key, you know, for a drill press. If you, if you don't know how that works, essentially on the quill of a drill press, there will be a slot um, for sliding in a uh, drift key and uh, you give her the bonk like that and the taper and it releases the um, whatever happened to be in the, the drill press, the, the drill bit or the chuck or what have you that fits up inside that uh, Morse taper. So that was just a quick, you know, cut out, out of flat bar kind of tool. That was probably like year one kind of thing. Because, but you had to hang on to this as I recall. This was your tool. So you were assigned a toolbox and they gave you little brass tags 
um, if you wanted to sign out other tools. You only had so many brass tags and you had to go to the tool crib. The attendant, his name at the time was Al, a very dry sense of humor, but a good guy. Uh, took his tools real serious. Um, they would not give you one of these. You made this, you hung on to it, you lost it. Tough titty. Find somebody that will lend you one. Of course, the projects progressed, you know, through the years. Some of these are more complicated than others. I really enjoyed all of the time at school because it was a fantastic opportunity. If you worked hard, you retain the knowledge and you were decent at the skill set, the, 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 prof the professor, the teacher that taught it. Uh, awesome guy, a German trained machinist. He did not play games. He was very serious, but he was more serious to those that didn't take the class serious, if that makes sense. If you worked hard and showed you were making an effort, he treated you with respect, but if you excelled and you actually got the skill, he pretty much just left you alone because you, you were on the right path. He taught you, he left you, you developed the skill. He actually went as far to kick, um, not kick, remove several gentlemen from the program early on. You gotta keep in mind when I started this, it was a 50-50 uh, thing right out of high school. So in your, well, I don't know what they call them. I know a lot of our viewerships from the United States. So what would that be? Your senior year of high school? Anyways, here, grade 11 and 12, half of grade 11 and half of grade 12, you went to the vocational school or to the college to start an apprenticeship in a trade if you were accepted into the program. And that's, that's what I did. So I started the machinist deal right out of high school. What was my point? Oh, that, of course, so we're, we're of teenage, you know, we're high school age guys. So um, he wasn't so much kicking people out of the, the course in their first year of the apprenticeship, um, merely advising them that maybe the trade they had selected wasn't going to be their sort of thing. And it was at a good point you could do that because they were young enough that he could involve the parents and there could be a meeting. And you know he really did care to see that these young men were gonna be set on a, a career path that would have them flourish instead of fail. Uh, step punch. This was a lathe project. I, I'm not going to remember what years of the apprenticeship these were from. This is a pretty basic project. In the first couple years, there was a lot more shop time, as I recall. And in the third and the fourth year, a lot less time on the tools and a lot more theory. Uh, because the theory was more in depth. You were doing things that were a lot more serious. So simple lathe project. There would have been a drawing. Each of these diameters were a uh, specific diameter and a specific length. You had to hand these projects in, right? And the, if you can picture the uh, the teacher, he would have had uh, he would have had a set of he had, well his were digital. He had a set of digital calipers, and then uh, you know, and then he would have had a mic set, you know, and he would sit in his office and he would check everything. Like, you know, you see some teachers and they just grade, you know, yeah, that's pretty close. Huh? This guy uh, took it very seriously, very seriously. Yeah, he was a very easy man to respect because he just had a degree of seriousness around him. He treated you like, a, you know, he treated you like a grown man, you know, a peer. You were there to work together. Anyways, he would measure all these. Knurling, uh, if you don't know what that is, the, this kind of diamond pattern here on the the shank of the step punch. It taught you how to learn to use the knurling tool on the lathe and all that kind of good stuff. Oh, and I can't remember what this was made out of, but uh, this project along with, I just remembered another one that I forgot, this and this. These were done at the same time. This is just a cold chisel. Uh, these were done at the same time and they were actually heat treated. So again, another process we learned to use temperature sticks. We heated these up to a certain temperature and then they were quenched in oil. Wow, this is pretty self-explanatory. You can kind of see what's going on here. It's just the nut and a threaded shaft. But the project did have a purpose. Um, the purpose, it was a lathe project. The point of this one was to learn how to machine a square thread. So I don't know if you can see that profile there. Not only did we have to turn all the right diameters, this also involved, oh, what does this say on the end of it? 
Oh, I thought some of these still have the grade on the in felt pen written on them. Um, you had to make the tool out of high speed steel, which I do have a bunch of those still as well. I kept, I kept all those. You had to make the tool. You had to turn the shaft. Uh, these nuts, while the outside of it already is uh, a standard nut, the inside was not. So you had to machine out the inside, cut the, the appropriate square thread to match. Yeah, and then he would have graded you on the, uh, the fitment of, of the nut. So if you can, if I go like this, well, actually I gotta hold it here because that's where the mic is. You can't, you hear no clinking, clink, clink, clang back and forth because it's a tight fit and that's what you were going for. There was a, a fitment that you were shooting for. I had to use a mic and there's, there's a bunch of other things. Three wire method. I don't know, this isn't gonna ring a bell for a lot of people, but the three wire method of measuring thread depth with a micrometer. I remember all that was all, that was all thrown in there. Some of them had no purpose. This is my favorite one. See that? This was the cube and plate. And it is exactly what it sounds like. This is a cube and this is the plate that the cube fits in. Now the beauty of this project, this was 100% manufactured by hand. You cut you off a chunk, gave you a file and a set of micrometers and you set to it. This whole project was hand filed. So this had to be parallel, these two faces to each other within a certain tolerance. The outside of this block had to be a certain tolerance and the real shining star of the whole project was the fitment of the cube in the plate in every single direction and configuration. And I can tell you right now, that German professor, he triple quadruple checked all of this stuff. I got 98% on this out of 100. One kid, because you might be thinking, well, what would stop you from cheating? Because they were, were being treated like adults, right? So you could put this in your pocket and you could take it home with you. Should you, you could work on it at home if you wanted because this took so long to do. This didn't, this wasn't a first try kind of thing. You didn't just make the cube and plate with a hand file to tolerance spec. And I'm talking tolerance spec, I wanna say that it was, most of it was plus or minus three thousandths of an inch. Super tight. It took a lot of tries. So he did say, you know, I'm pretty sure you could, I'm, you could take it home with you because you know, time allotments or whatever. Anyways, long story short, one of the kids, his dad was a machinist. He took his cube and plate material to the machine shop where his dad worked and his dad helped him on a milling machine, mill his cube and plate, and then they roughed it up with a file so they thought it wouldn't look like it had been done by a machine. He failed. He failed the project because the tolerances were not even close. So, you know, you tried to cheat and it didn't work and he got caught and it still didn't meet the tolerances of the project. So that one I like. This was another very, very simple project straight out of the gate. Uh, any guesses what that is? There's gotta be a couple of you fellas that know what that thing is already. It's just a simple drill gauge for 118 degree uh, drill for sharpening bits. Quick reference, it's got um, graduated markings uh, stamped in it right there. And uh, yeah, this is all hand cut with a file marked out. And uh, you simply go like that. That would give you a reference for uh, sharpening your drill bits. Again, this is a tool they wouldn't hand out. So, you know, we're all wearing our, our coveys. You know, you, you are very proud, right? A tool that you made with your own two hands. You'd, you'd pack it around. That shit, I'm still packing it around. I don't use it that much. Sharpening drill bits is kind of like, uh, it's like riding a bike. You just do it. Step blocks. These are practical for um, milling machine applications. Step blocks, you can see why they're called step blocks. I mean, pretty simple, right? They fit together. Again, we were given a drawing, all cut to tolerance. And these ones actually weren't hand filed, they were cleaned up, but uh, you can see the swirl marks on uh, there. If I was using a better camera other than a GoPro, you'd be able to see the swirl marks of where these were milled on a milling machine. Now, if you don't know what a step block is for, 
you simply, what can we, wow, here, right here, one tool. This would sit flat. This would be the, the base of your uh, you know, milling machine, drill press, um, you know, typically stationary machines, a boring mill or something like that. These come in various sizes, so, you know, some very huge. So if you're trying to clamp something down, this would be like this, and then you'd have a finger clamp that would sit on the step. And then out here would be your workpiece. And then there'd be a nut on top of here. You tighten it down and it would, it would hold that workpiece down, you know? So it gave you a, a lot of configurations. You could also use them for supporting workpieces and because, you know, they're, right, you got adjustment. But typically, those would be used with a, a finger clamp kind of setup. And I'll tell you, if in the comments there's questions about what some of these were for, and you're not familiar, well, just put it in the comment and, uh, you know, we could always do a follow-up video and we can address it in a little bit more detail. This was a good one. So, in the first year, uh, oh, and by the way, this one, just because I don't want you guys to think I'm making this stuff up, that still has the grade written on it. 100%, you know, it's no big deal. My mom thought it was a big deal too, so it's okay. Um, in the first year of the, the college program, if your first year of your apprenticeship, uh, you're hot out of the gate, machinist and millwright were linked together. So you didn't have to decide until I think almost three quarters of the way through the course which one you wanted to do. They trained you because a lot of the skills you learn up front are, are transferable. A lot of the time in the first and second year, you didn't even really do too much on actual equipment. It was all hand tools. A lot of hand tool stuff and a lot of theory around bearings and chains and fitments and shafts and gear. There was a whole host. I mean, I got stacks of books like that and I don't remember most of it. So anyways, this was more of a millwright project. Uh, this is... Again, if you, if you care to guess, which I don't really know how that works. They would say, oh, guess in the comments. If you can guess in the comments, what I'm about to tell you. That's a chain tensioner. Simply a handle. And think of in a sawmill or a mill application, you got big link chain, right? It's got big old links on it. And uh, you'd hook in a link. You'd hook in a link like that. And then uh, this, by tightening this, see the tooth move, you would tighten up the chain to a, to a certain point. Maybe you're trying to get it tight enough so you can uh, install a master link and away you go. So V-blocks, why do they call it a V-block you think? Any guesses? The V-block, that's another uh, milling machine, drill press oriented tool typically. Um, couple of different patterns in this one, but mostly for holding shafting. The shaft will sit in the V, and then there is a hold down like this, and typically you're gonna put, you know, some sort of soft sacrificial material maybe under that hold down to clamp. So this hold down, the V block is, um, the V block would be sitting, maybe you got your shafting in it, this is holding the shafting in the V-Block. I can't even explain it. There's a thousand configurations, um, but that was a milling machine project. Those were the V-Blocks. This was made out of flat bar. There's welds on the inside here. And then uh, these were machines, so it all, it all fits together. Uh, these are not overly useful to me in my current setup. When we get the shop together, uh, maybe they'll become useful again. I'll tell you, it'd be, Handy like pockets in your underwear to have a have a little mill um, and a little bit bigger drill press than I already have at the moment. This would have been. Ooh, is there a grade on the end of that? Man, it's rusty. You're gonna have to take my word for it. Ninety-eight oh, percent. I couldn't make this if my life depended on it. Now, this was supposed to replicate a kind of like a stub axle assembly. So. Uh, it, it involved a bunch of projects all wrapped up into one. A lathe project, obviously, um, to teach a whole bunch of what you learn in theory in practicality on the lathe. This end piece is a bearing seat. This is a taper, and I, if memory serves me, I think he actually had a tapered cone that he used to test fit this piece. Uh, and then it's threaded. This is, see that unthread there? 
So we actually made the jam nut as well. So there's the jam nut, it threaded on here. And then if these will, oh yeah, oh. Keep to pop those off. One and two. There's the rest of that shaft assembly. I've, if it looks funny, like I'm diving over, I just don't know how well you can see. And uh, like I said, because of the GoPro, not very good at all, I'd imagine. But this was tolerance fit. There's a key, little keyway. And uh, we actually made the key, I hand filed the key, milled the key in, uh, all that good stuff. And then uh, these were fun to make actually. So there's a spacer, made a plastic spacer. And uh, these are two plastic gears. Uh, that would have been in the portion of theory where you learned how to calculate a gear of specific number of tooth and diameter and um, and then on an indexing head. And what's the simplest way to explain what an indexing head is? Uh, it's basically a chuck that holds a workpiece and it's got a bunch of plates and other gizmos on it, but basically you, you crank a handle X amount of times to get this gear to rotate so far to cut the next tooth. So every time you do this procedure with the handle, this would move over one tooth and you would zzz, 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 zzz. you'd cut on a, on a horizontal milling machine with a whole other setup on it. But then, anyway, that's the theory behind that. I only did anything to do with gears outside of making these two in my entire career, which was not long one other time. Man, the tolerances on that are fantastic. I can, it just, you know when something fits good, well together, it just fits well. It's got that like feel. That's what this has. Glad I hung on to all this stuff. Tighten that back up. Yeah. And this, well, why am I save this for last? Because, well, because this has not been taken apart well, this hasn't been taken apart and I don't know how long. I gotta grab All right, I wanted to bring you in a little closer for this last one because uh, this one actually comes apart. I, I took the liberty of pre-gathering the tools. This nifty block doesn't actually do anything. Its sole purpose was a, uh, was a drill press project. So of course you did a whole section of the apprenticeship theory on the drill press. And that involved, well, let's take it apart first and then I'll tell you what all was involved. So, well, that's a good sign. These were stored in my office, a bunch of these. So it's not like they've been out exposed to the rather cap headed bolt there. Oh, that's not too bad. A little, a little seized, a little wear and tear. I can remember a lot of gentlemen having to restart this project as well. And uh, the reason it had to be restarted, it looks simple. And I'll, once I explain to you, let's get these studs out of the way. Look, look at this. Of course, I got the beefiest wrench. Mac tools, belong to my grandfather. Oh, it's not even tight. Not even tight. There's a stud there. Oh, that one's more than finger tight. That one out of there. The reason that guys had to restart this project, if I'm re recollecting properly, was because of clamping malfunctions. You can see all the stuff, and you kind of get the gist if you got a keen eye. There's two blocks here, and everything I've taken out is threaded. So obviously, one block has threads in it, one block does not have threads in it. Nothing but the best around here, eh? Nice clunky craftsman set of Allen keys. Better than none. What are you doing? Oh. All right, we're home free. Get that out of there. All right, so we, before we totally destroy this part, this one was really neat because it it provided you opportunity to learn all the functions of, of the drill press. Um, so the criteria, there is of course the, the center hole here, 
That was drilled and then reamed to a very specific dimension, a one inch hole. So you got to use uh, the drill and select the correct drill size for this, the proper reamer and then get the correct feed for the reamer and all that kind of stuff. So you had that. Uh, these two corner bolts are simply an exercise in just drill and tap. Drill and tap and um, countersink to recess the, uh, the head of the bolt in. So there was a, another tool for that. You drilled it, you tapped it, uh, you used a counter, or not a, not a countersink. These are countersunk. These are counter bore, uh, counter bore tool. So that was that. And then like I just alluded to, uh, these are countersunk. So you got uh, like a pan headed shape or countersunk. These are fine threaded. Everything's metric, of course, where we live and the way she goes. So two countersunk. And then these corner ones, you'll notice I didn't take anything out of these corner ones. These were drilled for uh, roll pins and I, I don't have the roll pins. Uh, I don't know where they went. Took them out because, uh, you know, if you had the roll pins in, you wouldn't be able to take it apart. But um, the reason most guys had to restart this project is it had to stay aligned all the time, right? Because all this had to line up or wouldn't fit together. None of the bolts would line up. So they, you know, a guy would get to go in and, and then, you know, something would dislodge and move around and, oh, the point was though, the, the intention of the project had that in mind. If you do these in the right order, there's no risk to that. So, you know, in the case of this, if you clamp this together and say, drilled these two spring pin holes first and drove your spring pins in, or roll pins, well then the blocks would never move, nothing would ever move, and you could do everything else. So every single project had a lesson in it. Uh, these two studs, they're opposite each other. So on one, the long end is a coarse thread and on this end is a fine thread, vice versa on the other. And uh, these flats had to be hand ground onto them. Of course, they were checked for parallel. He checked everything. At least that's how I remember it in my mind. And uh, yeah, anyways, it made for a good time. Oh, see, I already got that wrong. One of these is coarse, one of those is fine. Throwing me curveballs. So the way it went, um, I of course made it through all the years of schooling. Out of here's the, here's the interesting part, and it kind of reflects on where the state of the trades are. Out of 16 gentlemen that I went to school with, uh, to my knowledge, I only know of two that continued on in, in that chosen trade. I could be wrong, plus or minus one or two. Some of the guys went on to do millwright stuff, but purely machining, of all the guys I trained with and completed fourth year uh, and, and got our ticket, our, our provincial ticket uh, for machining, I only know of two of them that, uh, that continued on with the trade. And uh, funny enough, they were, they were two of the best guys in the class. Uh, so you might be wondering maybe then what my story is around the machining and why I didn't stick with it because I obviously don't do it anymore. If you've watched back in enough videos, you might have noticed me just running around swinging a hammer now once in a while and doing other sorts of hijinks. I machined throughout my whole apprenticeship. Of course you had to, you needed the sponsor hours. Um, I did the majority of my time at a very small shop, small to the point where the biggest it ever got was me, one other employee and the owner, but he had been in business for like 40 years. Uh, was it perfect? No, but I don't think I could have asked for a better apprenticeship. Uh, just the amount of knowledge. It was what you'd call kind of a jobber shop, meaning uh, all repair, very little manufacturing, pretty much all repair work. Um, so there were the variety was crazy. I mean, we did all kinds of stuff, oddball stuff. Uh, while I worked there, I made everything from simple pins and bushings for sawmill applications and shafting, fabrication projects, right up to we built a whole bunch of, once we built a whole bunch of parts and pieces for a home-built airplane, 
Um, we had a real odd guy that would come in. He came in for months actually, he was real secretive. He always had these very mm, drawings you kind of had to decipher and he would never tell you what the pieces were for. It turned out that the man was trying to invent a perpetual motion machine. So I have eccentric stuff like that, all sorts of things. I'm very grateful to, uh, to that couple that gave me that opportunity because I actually, I actually had to beg for that job. At the time I was trying to get my apprenticeship, you, they were not handing them out. There was no interest. There, there was not the demand for people like there is right now. <laughs> I showed up and trust me, I tried to get a job everywhere else, man. Um, bigger shops, you know, cause you thought maybe you'd get more money or whatever, but this little hole in the wall, I showed up and uh, the guy told me, he told me to piss off basically. His name was Bill. And uh, Bill told me to hit the, hit the bricks. And uh, I think, I might have this wrong order. I don't think it was that same day, but I followed up and I spoke to his wife and, and she's what drove it forward. I remember him over at a rated alarm drill press. He had a shopping cart full of plates drilling holes through them. Cause we used to make axles for kiln carts, for uh, sawmill kilns. You made the, you fix the wheels, you made axles for them but you do thousands of them at a time. Just when I told you we didn't do any manufacturing, but once in a while. He was doing this job and it's particularly grueling because even at that time he was, he was quite elderly man. His wife give him shit, Bill, you give this young man a job, you need the help, you know, you can't be doing this by yourself. And, uh, and that's how my apprenticeship started. <laughs> through, a, through a husband and wife conversation, I, her, her telling him that you know, he better get cracking and hire me. Um, so I worked there and I mean that involved everything. For once he kind of got on to me that I knew what I was doing, it kind of got to the point in towards the end of my time being there that he just, he wouldn't come in sometimes till, you know, late in the day. There was a few times he didn't come in at all. He'd just tell you, could you please answer the phone while you're here? Uh, but you know, it's his business. He, he was a good guy, always up to stuff, taught me a lot of things. Um, I got myself fired there once. He uh, wasn't a lot of money in those, that time. And I felt that I was worth more money and I kind of approached it like an entitled child would do, as you can imagine. I was just, you know, I was a teen and I told him, hey man, I'm spending X amount of money to get my truck here and, and I think I even used the line, I could get, I'm, they're making more, I'm paying more money at other shops and I had all the stuff you're not supposed to do. He looked me dead in the eye and he said, pack your shit and leave. You're done. He didn't even think about it. He didn't even let me finish my spiel. He said, you're done. Pack up, leave. Out. And um, I, he said it in a tone, he was not kidding. So there I was. I loaded my toolbox in my truck and um, well, the way I remember the story, I went home and I could not bring myself to tell my mom and dad that I had done that, that I had gotten fired from my apprenticeship. My apprenticeship wasn't done. I needed the hours. I needed him as a, an apprentice sponsor. And I, what had I had done? I, I, instead of approaching him like a man and discussing my wages, I, I uh, you know, inexperience, life inexperience, got fired. And I, I just couldn't bring myself to, to face my mom and dad and tell them that. So I didn't, I didn't even unload my toolbox. I went back the next day, showed up before eight, before they opened, you know, he was there and uh, he didn't say too much. I just said, I, you know, sir, I, I really need this job. And he said, I know. And uh, yeah, I went back to work <laughs> like it never happened. I didn't get a raise either. Not right away anyways. Oh shit, I'll tell you, that's a hard lesson. But um, worked there, went on to, uh, eventually did leave. You know, I outgrew the shop. He, he couldn't afford to pay and I, I was trying to grow a life. So I moved on to uh, another shop which was hugely beneficial to my career. A hydraulic shop, so not as much machining, but uh, made a lot of great friends that I still have today. Uh, or you know, people that uh, I got to know in the industry and stuff like that. And uh, anyways, that was, thus ends the story of my machining career. I, I moved out of machining and 
well into the sales side of that business for some reason, but uh, life takes you where it takes you. Anyways, I hope you found some of this interesting. I'm glad I dug these old projects out. I'm gonna hang on to them, you know? My, uh, my kids find it interesting once in a while. You know, you always, I think all of us, all of us parents, you know, we got that box of stuff, you know, from our life that we've hung on to and kids like to rummage through it once in a while. Uh, anyhow, I don't know what the next adventure is gonna be, but I will certainly see you then.